transit and releases it, and it drops down into the water at about the right angle. This is actually a little bit steeper than it's supposed to be. It's supposed to hit it at about 22.8 degrees. This, as you can see, is a little bit steeper than that. But that's what NASA has been doing for, for testing for the splashdown. Okay, now, you can see that the timeline here, what we're going to do, I want to get back to NASA TV and see where we are. Most of 
the shuttle, which this thing comes in and it stays intact, it just heats up and dissipates the heat. In the case of the uh, Orion space capsule, it actually burns up, sloughs off, burns up, heats up, sloughs off, etc. So you'll lose about 20% of the heat shield as it comes back in. You know, so it's quite thick, you'll lose a little bit of it, but it's essentially designed to heat up till it gets to the point of burning and then that portion will slough off and it's constantly sloughing off material and plating to keep you heating. And on this test, it will be coming in, uh, let's see if the education channel has the, sometimes they lose their video feed as well. Okay. In any case, yes, as you can, perfect timing! It's like I planned it this way. Ah. So, in any case, <laughs> as it's coming back in, it's about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on, the, on the bottom of the uh, Orion spacecraft. When the when it comes back from the lunar surface, which will be coming back at essentially 100% speed, what you would expect then, it'll be coming in even faster, and it'll be, you know, it, it will be about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They, don't, they didn't need to take it up to 5,000 to do the testing. All they needed it today was to get up to about the 80% point. And they can extrapolate out the rest of the way to understand the characteristics of how it, how it works. Now, that being said, at the top of the Orion spacecraft, there still is, there still are a large number of this type of tile on the top of the Orion spacecraft. And the reason that, that you know, that the technology hasn't gotten any worse. I got my thumb here, I'm holding it. It's superheating this section, as you can see. Nice laser pointer, whoever's got that. Okay, you saw that it was superheated, but it cools immediately. Now, if I hold my hand out here, I can still feel the heat. But I can touch very close to that, and, no, and really no heat anywhere along here. And this will dissipate within an extremely short period of time. Already the heat is less. And if you want to feel that demonstration after all of our presentation today, you know, feel free to come on up and I'll do, I'll do this whole demonstration uh, just so you can feel that. Make sure I don't melt anything today. Get back to my timeline to know exactly what NASA supposedly is going to be showing up. This is, this is a big demons here right now, so try to keep up with what they're doing um, as well as talk to you all. Okay, so the thrusters, um, uh, they just tested the thrusters for re-entry um, just literally about two minutes ago, and here in about four minutes, the Orion is going to come back through the Van Allen radiation belts. Um, they experienced it on the way out, and what happens is, is it goes through the Van Allen radiation belts, those areas where we have ex extremely high radiation, they shut down and send, you know, most of the equipment on the actual spacecraft before it passes through the Van Allen radiation belts. Um, they shut off all of the cameras, sensing systems, etc., with the exception of the radiation detectors. Um, and then it comes back in, and then after it passes through the Van Allen radiation belts, they power everything back up. One of the other things that they're testing on this mission is some of the heat shielding, or not heat shielding, radiation shielding concepts for Orion, and in fact, there's actually a student experiment on board Orion right now that uh, some students, uh, uh, college students, came up with, and uh, they, they created, uh, anybody, besides my uh, IT techie in the back, anybody know what the Tesseract is? <laughs> What's the Tesseract? You're not, you're not going to go all geeky on me, huh? No, I'm not, not right now. <laughs> in, in any case, if you know the lore of Thor, Norse gods and the movie Thor that came out not too long ago. Tesseract was one of the, the very powerful items that could, etc. In any case, though, it, it had essentially a tetrahedron type of shape to it. And the device that they built for their experiment has multiple different shielding systems with, rate, with about 10 radiation detectors on the inside of it. And what they're doing is, is that this, this thing's on the inside and they're testing all these different ways of shielding the radiation. And, uh, and getting the measurements off of the radiation detector. So um, NASA decided to put some student experiments on board, uh, flying it up there and then returning it back here uh, uh, to Earth for the testing. Yeah? There's also an action figure. I was just, I was just, I was just getting to that one. So, uh, yeah, once, once again, Jack is, Jack is leading me here because I wanted to talk about the student experiment. So, and then as well, 
NASA doesn't fly stuff without memorabilia on board. It started off on day one when Alan Shepard went up into space. Not only did he take stuff up with him, they always allowed the astronauts to take a number of personal items. Um, they had what was called a PPK, personal preference kit, um, that they were allowed to take up. They could put stuff in their pockets as long as it didn't affect the weight significantly. And they had a personal preference kit, which essentially was a bag that they could put items into as well. But NASA also had kits that they flew up there that had memorabilia inside of it. It's how we end up with the flags that you see on display that people either have at their houses or we have here in the museum up on the, uh, up on the fourth floor on 4B. Um, it's how you end up with you know, little bits of memorabilia. I, I don't have it on right now because I do not wear it very frequently. My Naval Academy class ring flew up on a shuttle mission to the International Space Station. Steve Bowen, that guy that I mentioned, we graduated from the Naval Academy together. He was a submarine officer, I was a submarine officer. We served in the fleet together. Then he became an astronaut. I became a museum director in the space world. So we've maintained pretty close contact you know, since 1982. Uh, and in any case, so when he flew up on his second or his, his uh, yeah, second mission, he took up my class ring um, uh, up into space, and he also took a picture of my family. So I've got a really great picture of my family's picture floating in front of the, uh, um, the window on the International Space Station. And then when he flew his final flight, that he flew on STS-132 and STS-133, he, he was the first astronaut to ever fly back-to-back -back missions, and it was because one of the astronauts on STS-133 broke his collarbone six weeks before the mission, and they needed a replacement. He had just flown on 132. He was in charge of the spacewalking branch. Needless to say, NASA went tag, your are in, and he flew again. Um, short period of time. He took up a gigantic uh, uh, Go Navy Beat Army flag um, for me. That had been signed by multiple astronauts, Naval, Naval and Naval Academy uh, guys. President Bush, the elder, the Navy pilot, signed it as well. Um, and then it's now, I've got pictures of it up on the International Space Station. But in any case, personal preference, things that you can take up for yourself, for your friends. But NASA flies a ton of stuff as well. In this situation, um, they asked a number of science luminaries to donate items. So. They've got everything from an Iron Man challenge coin from the director of the Iron Man movies. Uh, uh, William Shatner gave them an action figure of him in the environmental control suit um, from back in one of his uh, uh, from one of his episodes. Um, the cookie from Cookie Monster from Sesame Street because Sesame Street does a ton of stuff with NASA. So Ernie Robert Ducky, the cookie from Cookie Monster, and oh boy, had one more item from Sesame Street. I can't remember what it is. So, uh, but three items from Sesame Street, you know, have flown uh, or flying on this mission. Uh, numerous, obviously, patches, flags, things like that. They have the weight to be able to, to, to do it, especially on a mission like this. So they're going to fly it. When the last mission of the shuttle flew, they had cargo carriers like this, multiples of them, that they flew up with thousands and thousands and thousands of, thousands of flags and pins and everything else. Because, to be brutally honest, they didn't know when they were going to be flying a manned mission again. And uh, so one of the things that, that NASA does that they fly on these missions, okay, I'm down, no, sorry. If you ever see it start doing that, say something. Yeah, it froze. I should have noticed it when I didn't hear them talking for a while. Okay. Look at that. We're at 450 miles. And standing still. What you've got going as well right now is, is that uh, Everybody is accessing NASA's. If you could, go up to the fourth deck and make sure that NASA TV is up and operating. Okay. If this freezes up horribly, we'll make a quick shift up to the fourth deck where we have cable TV providing NASA TV, and we'll crowd in up there and watch uh, the last bits of it. Because and we're going to need that quick, because because splashdown occurs in less than 15. Okay. Actually, there's the uh, Iconic aircraft flying along. Check where we are here. Okay, we are six minutes from re-entry. So, um, what was that? Memorabilia. Oh, on that last mission, they flew, you know, the, the, the many large containers. On manned missions, um, one of the things that they always fly up is little silver Snoopy things. And for anybody who understands, uh, or knows um, about the NASA program, uh, one of the things that they present to people who make key contributions to the space program, the Silver Snoopy is the award that's given out. Very few are given out because they fly very few of them uh, on these missions. NASA gives them out to key individuals who make significant contributions. They have to be nominated by somebody who gets reviewed by NASA, just like an award coming from the Armed Forces kind of thing. And in this situation, in, in that situation, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, they get these little silver snoopies, and I mean, you wear one of those things with pride. Um, if you're anywhere in any of these contract organizations in NASA, etc., they are actually all presented also by astronauts who flew on, on the mission, etc. Well, they knew they weren't going to be flying again, so they flew a ton of silver snoopies on that last uh, uh, NASA mission because they knew it was going to be a while before they were able to actually uh, fly it again. So that gives you an idea of where the capsule is right now, coming in in orbit. It's just about to uh, uh, just about to re-enter as well. Who has any questions on anything I've gone over so far? I know we're covering tons of material here quickly and probably not everything that we need to. And I, and I have a feeling, just so everybody knows, we're probably going to be migrating here very quickly because this is keeps getting locked up. You know, let's wait until we find out for certain that everything's up and operating up there. But yeah, I think we're going to have to go to the fourth deck. Apologize for that. Um, from what I understand from NASA, um, and paying attention to the uh, broadcast this morning, they had the same problem during the launch time this morning. For that, for the five minutes before launch and for the five minutes after launch, their signal did this. Uh, and it's because they had so many people logging on at that given point in time that it's essentially it's not crashing their servers, it's just slowing it down so much that you're not getting the update rate necessary. To, uh, uh, to have it fully go in, so. <laughs> Are we good to go up there? We know. What's that? What's that? We're good. We're good. Let's go ahead and move up to the fourth floor. So, so entry interfaces when they start hitting the atmosphere, and we'll start to lose this signal from it. It could. It, it, it never. Not knowing exactly what you saw up there. But just, just, it, just two little bright lights. It could very well be that you, you got to remember as the spacecraft separate, you know, you have a lot of debris um, that still are surrounding the spacecraft. And so the Apollo astronauts, everybody, you know, they, they experience this um, uh, whenever you separated the two spacecraft. You still had stuff trailing along with you. Uh, eventually you separate from it because it's completely different weight, um, et cetera. But because you're in a vacuum, it just travels, you know, it's physics. It travels along with you at the same speed. Now, once it hits the atmosphere, you know, everything will change. This is a feed from the spacecraft. You'll, we will lose the feed, actually, from the spacecraft um, uh, once it hits uh, the, uh, the, the re-entry interface and starts getting into the, the significant portion of the heating. And hence, that's why they said, you know, enter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and now they have to go back to the animation because once it hits that re-entry interface and the heat starts to occur around it and you get these significant plasma gases and everything else, it's communications blackout. And we'll lose communication for in this situation. So it should be about five and a half minutes. So we will see exactly we will see exactly what happens. So it's starting to heat up, you know, the the, the altitude, et cetera. Yes. And slowing down. So with the shuttle, one of the things is it would, you know, it come in at an angle like this. And then one of the other ways that they actually slowed it down was it went through a whole series of banking turns. A lot of people don't know that as well. The shuttle is it's, that is the emission control room. Uh, the shuttle would go through a whole series of banking maneuvers like this to help bleed off the speed as it came down through in, in its re-entry. So generally those were programmed, although um, uh, uh, Joe Engel, uh, who landed the shuttle on STS-2, he actually manually controlled the spacecraft. He's the only one who ever did that um, through the entire process as well. This is the one time uh, where Orion uh, would be uh, experiencing. Are these people in uh, Houston or? They're in Houston. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, the, some of the. And, and you see interviews and things being done today? That they're, they're, the, the control of the interviews and the whole thing is being done out of Florida, out of one of the hangars there. That's where the lead, lead PR uh, gal is. But for all of this portion of it, they're they're operating it out of Houston. So the guy that you hear, he's sitting in the back right corner. Um, they're in mission control, um, where we just see the public affairs officer. He's in on the loop, so he's hearing everything that's going on. 
And then he's also obviously giving a blow by blow. He's extremely knowledgeable, obviously, about everything that goes on um, uh, in mission control. But what you're seeing the shots of is in mission control in Houston. <clears throat> and I can't remember, that's a shot from the Icona aircraft. So remember that drone? That's the spacecraft. Drone there? There's a drone. It's, a, it's an Akana drone, I K H A N A. It's flying around. Sorry, every now and then I'm doing Akana, unpiloted airborne vehicle called the Pacific Ocean. It'll just fly around the ground. Find this flag down to 7 minutes. Ah! Range is flying around. You can see some of the, you can see the different lighting up at the top and around the edges, and you can see flame every now and then. From the flame coming around. How high up is that? Yeah, it's on top of the cloud cover. It's above the cloud cover, I know that. But I'm not sure exactly what altitude is like. But the Icona is similar to the drones that we see flying around here. And uh, it's NASA owned, they fly it around, they use it for multiple tests. And it's being utilized for this to get video of the uh, of the spacecraft as it comes back in. And the thing that we're really obviously looking for and that they really want video of is the the chutes opening, the entry interface, et cetera, et cetera. Orion at 125,000 feet. There you Here and see the, the shoot range coming on. Uh, about five yeah. tracking device on that. On the Akana? Mm -hmm. they, what they, ha they have is they do, he does have a stabilized camera um, and they know where the spacecraft was, but there's nothing that's sending a signal from the spacecraft to the Akana to keep it locked in. is giving us whichever best feed they can think of at the moment. So, so in other words, the econ the reason they keep showing this is the Econa has nothing visually um, at the, the moment. Cover okay, the forward main cover is about to jettison off. Remember I said that they were going to recover that from the salver, from that salvage vessel, USNS salver. As that cover, once that pops out, that allows the chutes to deploy. 65? There. I think it is. And the spacecraft isn't actually doing that. That's the camera. <laughs> it's not maneuvering crazy like that. Is this different cameras? Yes, the, 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 the drone has multiple cameras as well. There's from the spacecraft looking up. Those are the drogue shoots. These are the drogue chutes that, that come out. They stabilize the spacecraft. There, you can see. Stabilize. Yeah, this, there was never anything like this from the Apollo program. It's still moving like a bat out of you nowhere. Did you say 15,000 feet? Yes. Coming up on the main two floor. So what will happen is the drogue shoots will release. You'll have two, you'll have more drogues that'll come out and then we'll pull the main shoots out, get them into the right configuration. And then the main shoots will start the reefing process. They'll open up to about 10%. Uh, there go the drogues, just released. There go the, yep. There's the mains and you'll see the reefing. They're open partially. If they were to open fully right now, they'd be destroyed. So they open partially, now you see them opening up a bit more. They'll get up to around 30 to 35 percent. And then as it slows down even further, now they're opening up fully. 
and it should come back in at tw about 20 miles an hour and hit the water at about 22.8 degrees. This is from the space. This is from the spacecraft. Oh, there's a shot. Wow. Yeah, the producer doesn't know which. <laughs> camera three, camera oh, three. Yeah. And you see, you see these parachutes also spread out. It can land with two chutes safely. And he can land with no shoots. <laughs> as, as, will, as Elon Musk said, he, he said he wants to say. <laughs> um, uh, he, they're the same. They're all the same length wires. So, but they but they come out and then they spread out like this. It's just aerodynamics. You mean bump into each other? Yeah, they can. They do. They, they, they come close together, but the air, air the aerodynamics actually they come close together and then they start separating out again. Um, Elon Musk has one of the most, the funniest quotes that I ever loved on this one. He says, "I want to die on Mars." He, he's trying. He's the owner of SpaceX and the founder and Mars. He's all about Mars. Get to Mars. Get to Mars. Get to Mars. He says, "I want to I want to die on Mars, just not on impact." <laughs> so. That's the problem here as well. You can land safely with the astronauts with two chutes, losing a third. In fact, we did lose a third one on one of the uh, Apollo missions. Um, but if you lose two chutes, the impact will be sufficient that it will kill the astronauts uh, on the inside. Or will likely kill the astronauts. Nothing is absolutely safe. I keep waiting for the shot from the ship, but it must be because it's still above the cloud layer. There it goes. Yep. Yeah, like I said, about 20 miles per hour when it hits the water. That's a Japanese. Yeah. They do have multiple aircraft up as well, so you've got helicopters up. You've got all sorts of craft up there. And in fact, on that Apollo mission, it was 15 where they lost one of the chutes. What happened is, is that they had a valve that was open and some of the fuel leaked out and it actually burned the chute up. And it was burning the, the uh, second chute when they actually got the water. You were asking about the chutes coming together? There you go. You can see them bouncing off of each other. It's going about 20 miles an hour right now. Bigger oh, they're huge. Um, if you uh, the exact diameter spread out, I'm not sure. But if you took one like over in the uh, Tay Center, most people can imagine the Tay Center, pulled it up in the middle of the Tay Center, it would spread out completely out to the edges and then hang down a bit. They're very large. In fact, when we have our induction ceremony next year, we're thinking we're probably going to do it in the Tay Center. We're actually going to get an Apollo era space chute, and we're going to. We're going to hang it in there as part of the decoration. So. Oh, it's flashed down. Somehow we missed it. <laughs> Yay! I keep waiting for a shot of it. Stable one means there's stable one and stable two. Stable two means it's upside down, but it's not sinking. So. Yeah. So stable one means that it's upright. Um, then the chutes release, and then they'll start, you know, trying to recover it. There we go. You can see it in the water. You got infrared footage, footage on the right. That's why it looks completely different. This is probably a shot from the uh, um, uh, from the uh, recovery ship. I'm very familiar with this shot because I've got some great video of when I was on the USS Dolphin, and we had a major fire and flooding casualty on the submarine, and we were on the surface and had to evacuate the ship in the middle of 15-foot seas, uh, and 
you've got the, the two videos, things like this, and you can see all of the crew members getting off, going into the water and everything else, because they show up at bright spots. It was at about 1 a.m. when all of that occurred. So that's why on the right you're seeing the infrared, which doesn't do much during the day. Okay. If we want to, we can move back down, down to uh, uh, down to the first floor. We've got some giveaways. First of all, can be utilized obviously to go to go up to the moon. Uh, one of the things uh, coming back from the Mars or the moon, the, your orbital, your velocities are essentially the same. Um, and one of the the missions that NASA is looking at for this right now, that's in their plan as it exists right now, it's an asteroid recovery movie. Or, uh, uh, mission, asteroid recovery movie. They may make a movie out of this. But in any case, an asteroid recovery mission. And what they're planning on doing is setting spacecraft up, grabbing a hold of, essentially, you know, with cargo netting, um, as it were, an asteroid, towing it back to lunar orbit, putting it in lunar orbit, and then sending up crews to go ahead and study it in lunar orbit. And that would be a test because they would send a crew out to get the asteroid, bring it back, and then they'd have other crews go up and explore it. Uh, but in any case, that's, you know, you'd be coming back from the, from the moon, et cetera. Yeah? How much of an asteroid is About half size is what they're planning on. Yeah? Area of a dark No, not as far as I know. Is, is it the uh, moon of the asteroid that actually farther out from Mars? No. The, there, well, it, it would be close. Well, I see what you're saying, yeah. So yeah. The, the ones that they're going after are ones that are they're, they're just yeah. nearby, yeah. Um, so, uh, on the video footage that we were watching upstairs, anybody have any questions on what we were looking at up there? Uh, no. I have, oh, sorry. You landed pretty close to where they wanted Oh, it must have, yeah. Because, they, you know, with them able to get video footage from the ship, you know, and, and, and the helicopter sent out to it, you know, you don't want the ship right underneath it. <laughs> That's not a good idea. The ship's off to the side, you know, so but it can get there pretty quickly, even in the Apollo days, it's the same thing. They did have one mission, though, where the video footage is, you know, you've got the, the, the helicopter taking footage, the aircraft carrier, and you can see the spacecraft coming down during the Apollo program. That was a little close, you know, that was 12. Um, who, you know, scored two home runs as far as targeting, because as a, on Apollo 11, we just wanted to be able to go out to land. You know, we needed to get up the land. Um, so, and, and there were problems with the computers, etc. So as Neil and Buzz are coming down to the lunar surface on Apollo 11, and the spacecraft pitches over, and they're able to see out the windows for the first time, it, Neil's looking out, and the target point that they're headed towards is a gigantic boulder field. You know, that was, and so it's not exactly where it's supposed to be coming down. It's like, this is not good, you know, because if you land that thing down, and one of those legs comes down on a boulder, you know, that's really bad. So he takes manual control of it at this point in time and starts accelerating it, flies past the boulder field over a gigantic crater, flies it further out until he gets to a place where he can see that it's a little bit clearer. Meanwhile, NASA's kind of getting a little antsy. He's slowly coming down um, uh, to try and land. You hear Charlie Duke give him the 30 seconds, basically tell him he's got 30 seconds of fuel remaining and they're still coming down. And it's in those final seconds. He probably had about 20 seconds of fuel remaining when they touched down. What happens with the Apollo spacecraft is that there's a probe that's sticking down from the lunar legs and on, on, a, on a few of them. And the, the minute one of those probes hit, that gave them a contact light. They made contact with the lunar surface. The minute they saw the contact light, bam, they shut off the engines and dropped down to the surface. They're talking about dropping this far. But still, you, boom, you drop on the surface. Well, your legs, you're in 1-6 gravity. You know, you can absorb that, no problem. Then, they, so they shut down the engine, boom. So it was not a soft landing, okay? On Apollo 12, on the other hand, they wanted those guys, Pete and uh, uh, Dick, or Pete and Al, excuse me, Al Bean and, and, uh, and Pete Conrad, they had a very precise landing location because they were trying to get right next to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft that had landed on the moon uh, a number of years before. And so they were supposed to land right next to it and then um, uh, go over to that spacecraft, cut certain pieces off of it, the camera and the scoop, um, take a look at the spacecraft, and then bring those pieces back to Earth. Um, they landed, literally, I mean, the, the surveyor was in a crater, they landed on the rim of the crater. Um, so, you know, bam, precision landing, NASA's uh, uh, the, the navigation systems, 
you know, Pete's landing, everything worked perfectly. When they came back in and landed the command module, they landed right next to the aircraft carrier, a little closer, really, than they should. All three of these guys were Navy pilots. Excuse me, naval aviators. Aviators are better than pilots. <laughs> they landed on carriers, moving postage stamps in the middle of the ocean. So they're better. Okay, naval aviators. These three naval aviators, um, uh, all at this point time commanders, within 24 hours, soon to be captains in the United States Navy, are coming in, and Dick Gordon's the command module pilot. Um, uh, and so that was kind of a joke is that they said that he was trying to catch the number three wire on the aircraft carrier as they were coming in. And one of the guys on the carrier did a cartoon of Dick Gordon sitting on the top of the command module holding the parachutes kind of thing and steering it in for a landing uh, on the carrier. I have a copy of that cartoon up in my office with a description from Dick, uh, from Dick Gordon. So but, uh, in any case, yeah, you don't want to be that close. So long anecdote around your original question. Sorry about that. So I have a tendency to go off on tangents. I had another question coming down the elevator. Somebody just asked me what my education background was. Um, I uh, grew up in Downey, California, where they built the Apollo Command Module and also the Space Shuttle uh, and went to high school there. Uh, grew up and went to high school there. Uh, after graduation from high school, I went to the United States Naval Academy. Uh, from 1982 to 1986, graduated in 1986 and went into the submarine force uh, and served in the submarine force for 20 years, retired in 2006, took over at the Kansas Cosmosphere at Space Center, a uh, space museum up in Kansas, did that for four and a half years and then came down here and have been here since. I also have a master's degree from the Air Force's Air War College as well. So uh, I've been indoctrinated on how air power can solve all of the world's problems. Um, uh, as well, so uh, so I kind of you know I've done the whole done the whole military thing and, and have that in my background plus um, uh, multiple years in the uh, in the museum field now uh, as well. So that being said, uh, I'm going to skip past. Oh, remember I mentioned that picture? There's a picture of my family up with that Steve Bowen there. And so okay, so Apollo. When we think of Apollo, and, and I've, I've given away a little bit of this lecture already because we had to talk about it with the Orion, and I'm not going to talk for very long here, just a few minutes, um, but literally I want to cover one thing that a lot of people may not realize here with New Mexico. Everybody thinks that when they think Apollo, they think this. Big, gigantic, Saturn V, 360 plus foot rocket sitting on the pad, gleaming white, day of the launch, you know, lift off, go to the moon, come back, but this is what everybody thinks of but this wasn't the start of the Apollo program. This was the biggest rocket in the Apollo program. It's still the biggest rocket we've ever launched, the Saturn V. Five, five F1 engines down at the bottom. If you want to see an F1 engine, go out and look at our rocket park. Ours is split apart in two pieces. The, the engine bell on it is split apart into two pieces. So that's why you know it looks the way it does when you go down there. <clears throat> but, we, uh, but, but this is what everybody thinks of. And yeah, we did launch a bunch of these. These are all the Apollo launches. Apollo 4 that I talked about previously, um, was the test of that we just saw today with Orion. When they did the same test as Apollo, that was Apollo 4. That was also the first time a Saturn V launched. And it was, as I mentioned this morning earlier, it was that launch where Walter Cronkite was completely freaking out because the glass in front of him, he and his, his co-anchor were having to hold it in place. The ceiling tiles were falling down around him, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's the only time I think I've ever heard Walter Cronkite really kind of lose it a little bit. He was excited. He was, he was like a kid with the space program, and you can hear it in his voice. You get a chance, I should I should probably bring it up on here, so, but you can go to YouTube, and you can actually listen to that broadcast, and it's funny um, to hear, because you've got the, you've got his co-anchor sitting in there talking about, we're having to hold the glass in here, Gronk guy going, look at that thing go, the ceiling's coming down, so, in any case, uh, we launched a number of these, the last would be when we launched the Skylab, actual um, Skylab space station, not the astronauts, but the space station up in orbit. So, the, so those were the biggies. Those were the ones with the, the five engines. We also launched these ones. The tiny Saturn rockets. Saturn 1, Saturn 1Bs. Uh, two versions of the smaller rocket. So similar size launch pad. you got to put it up on this big, what they call a milk stand. That's if it was our milk stool. Like a, if you were sitting on a milk stool and milking, you know, that's what this, this is right here. Launched from the top of that. This is what we used to launch the Apollo 7 astronauts. Uh, when they did the low Earth orbit, this is not going to this is not got enough power to get you to the moon, not enough stages, but it can get you up to low Earth orbit. We also used to launch the Skylab astronauts off. Uh, so that that was the Saturn One rocket. Yeah, we launched a bunch of these. 
you know, some of them look like what we expect with the capsule, or in this situation with the boiler plate up there. Some of them have these shrouds that are testing the engines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I'm going to hit move along to a number of those. The two different configurations, the Saturn 1 and the Saturn 1B. You saw the 1B first, and now you're seeing the Saturn 1. It's a whole bunch of these. But even these weren't the first of all the launches. These all occurred at, at, at Canaveral and Kennedy as, uh, as the uh, launches were. Today's launch was at Cape Canaveral. <coughs> it was not at Kennedy Space Center. It was actually at the Air Force Base from Canaveral, where it launched today. So just in case somebody asks you, the launch wasn't at Kennedy Space Center. You can see it. Kennedy Space Center, they're right next to each other. So you've got the Saturn V, you've got the Saturn 1B, you've got the Saturn 1, and then you've got this little squirt down here. Now walking 88 feet tall, the little show 2. So this was the first launches of the Apollo space program. And you put a Apollo spacecraft up at the top of the little Joe 2 booster, and you would launch it up, and it was utilized to simulate the launch of a Saturn rocket. It would give the same flight profile for the initial phases. It wasn't going to put you up into the orbit. Okay, but it was going to get you that initial launch simulation, and then you could use the abort system to pull the spacecraft away and test and make sure that that abort system would pull the spacecraft away safely, not with astronauts in it, with test equipment in it. But you could do those tests. And those tests were done in New Mexico, White Sands. So anybody here see those? Any of those launches? Well, sure. So, so um, but uh, in any case, so uh, right out here, launch complex, uh, uh, out on the, uh, out on the uh, White Sands Missile Range. Uh, you can see here, the, so if you're taking a look at our bird out here, you'll see the exact similarities, except for the paint job up here looks much better than ours. Ours is in horrible condition, so, and I'll, I'll, I'll say for the museum, we apologize for that. So it's been allowed to languish for decades uh, without refurbishment, so I'm working on getting the money to refurbish it now. So and when we refurbish it, we will paint it back in a White Sands Missile Range flight configuration. It's not the way it was painted when it was put up. But we're going to put it back into this configuration, this paint configuration. So just figured I'd let you know that uh, uh, while we're talking. That probably won't occur for another two years because we have to go. What's that? Before you change that, the height of those different rockets, yes. So these are at slight angle and there's maneuvering thrusters in here. 
So what will happen is, is that it won't go straight in front of it. It will actually go off to the side so that this, it separates it completely from this bad stuff down there. Um, and then as it gets further away, the whole configuration is, is that it starts to turn around and then the rocket engine motors up here light off and this portion here with that little nose cap up here separates from the command module and pulls it away and then the command module comes down with the parachutes and lands back on Earth. So that's what that is. And this is another note that's a cue ball for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, Saturn V rocket. It's the navigation system for it. So you've got down in one of the rings on an actual Saturn rockets. On an actual Saturn rocket down in here at one of the rings is where your navigation system is, the computers. The actual gyroscope that sends the signal down for what the rocket is doing is actually located up right here in the very tip of the cue ball. That's where the, that's where the, uh, the, the gyros were for the inertial navigation system. Because you want those as far away from the engines as possible. So you know, as you as you are lifting off and you're pushing from back here, a slight push down here has a significant change up here. So a slight change up here is sent a lot quicker with that inertial navigation system with those gyros, and it can send the signal down to the navigation system to make corrections to the engines most rapidly. So that's where your cue ball for the uh, Saturn V rocket was actually located as well, it was up at the very tip of that uh, uh, of that uh, abort system uh, tower. So if the uh, launch goes by that top section separates the when it gets up, when it gets up um, up into space, it pulls away. It does that at about the 14 minute point. And it just goes back into the ocean. Is that recovered? No, no. That's not recovered. Um, the first stage, none of, none of that's recovered. The engines, everything, it all, you know, it all falls back. Except for, they did actually go out and find um, uh, back about uh, three years ago. Three years ago. Um, uh, uh, Elon Musk and his team, uh, or uh, excuse me, Jeff Bezos, uh, and his team, uh, he created a team, they went out and they found the Apollo 11 engines. And they recovered them up off the bottom of the ocean. So, so yeah, they're, they're at the museum that they came from. So they're, they're, being, they're being refurbished up there, so, and restored. So, so, so that, that whole top section actually fell back down. <gasps> yes. It didn't stay on the bottom. No, it no, fell back there. Because it separated during, the, during that launch phase before you get it to orbit. So here's pictures of the launch. You look, you know, launches. You should look vaguely familiar. Yeah, the background out here, white sands. And in there, parachute coming back, landing in the desert. For those of you who were here when I was doing the uh, Orion briefing earlier, this is a little vaguely familiar. You know, so the abort test that we just did with Orion, even to the capsule sitting there, slight angle with the you know brush in the background. It's kind of scary. Those of you who didn't see it, I'll go, I'll go back and show you that photo here. It's kind of funny. Okay, so here's one of the actual tests that they did. So this this will give you a complete visual here. So you can, you can see the rocket is being destroyed by the ground control. They're doing that on purpose. They're destroying the rocket on purpose so that the abort system will sense everything and do what it's supposed to do. So the rocket starts to explode in this high speed image. The rocket is exploding, but now what you see with the rocket exploding down below it, things are not going well. In fact, that's, that's one of the fuel tubes coming down like that from the inside. So, But what you see here is you see those engines, remember I mentioned the solid rocket engines, have lit off. They haven't separated yet, but it's they, those have lit off. And then you have one of the steering solid rocket motors lighting off as well simultaneously. Next shot now, you can see this is falling apart completely. The surface module is still kind of intact, okay? But now you can see the separation there. There's the command module. Those engines are going full blast and it's pulling it away. Pulling it further away as the rocket explodes behind it. That's why I was asking if anybody saw this because I was wondering how crazy visible this was from you know, out of town here. Yeah, it must have been quite spectacular. There it is, continuing to pull it away.
so this one, you know, so so this was actually the pattern work test that was, you know, there were a few people who didn't see it this morning that was just done here uh, four years ago here at White Sands as well. Now, it was not a launch abort test. Launch abort test means that you put it on top of another rocket, you lift it off, then you do the abort. That's what we did with the Little Joe too. Pad abort, we also did pad aborts with the Apollo out here at White Sands Missile Range, but for the Orion, they decided that, as a, that they are going to do a launch abort test, and that's going to be done from Cape Canaveral. Um, they they uh, 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 just did the pad abort test here in White Sands Missile Range. So this one, this one's the pad abort test. Shape or form. 
Uh, the shuttle is different. The shuttle was, was controlled by the computers all the way down until you got into the final portion of the landing, and that was controlled by an astronaut, but it could have been landed remotely as well. In fact, the Russian shuttle, the Duran, was completely remotely <coughs> controlled. In fact, they had one flight of it, and everything from launch to landing, no crew, blew it up, flew it in space, came back down, landed, everything was remote controlled. You could do that with the shuttle, too. So, but we didn't, actually. It was controlled by the, by the commander uh, on the way back in. Uh, in any case, though, as I said, uh, you know, it looks kind of vaguely familiar from that Apollo launch abort test, you know, so what you see here. And there was the uh, abort system, you know, from the rocket engines when they went off that was uh, recovered back out there in the desert. And here they are cleaning up the chutes and the capsule, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Extremely similar. You know, as you, as you can see, yeah, I mean, you can see, okay, get back here. Look at that image right there. That's Ben Orion. The biggest difference, obviously, at the moment is size. And then, oops, I thought I had the picture of the thing. Oh, yeah, you have to go by. Yeah, like, oops. I'm having a moment. There's the picture of the Apollo sitting in that same configuration in the desert. Yeah, essentially the same. Once again, um, as I was you know, in the presentation this morning, capsules are back. You know, so they're back in vogue. So they never went out of vogue. Soviets have been using their Russians. Right. <laughs> too, many years, too many years fighting the Cold War. So the, the Russian, you know, the Russians um, uh, continue to use capsules. The Chinese use capsules. SpaceX uses the capsule. We're going back to capsules for, for NASA's main uh, manned spacecraft, you know, the, the Orion, which is obviously blue today. So, so. yes, you mentioned that. that uh, by the way, my presentation is done, so we kind of go into question and answer, or you can feel free to leave, enjoy donuts, coffee, et cetera, et cetera. Well, oh, yeah, we got to go to drawing. Yep. Yep. All right. it's all, it actually is all automatic. No, I mean, you mean the abort system is what I was talking about. Yeah. Is there, is there yes, there is, yes, there is an automatic abort. That's what you saw being tested in that footage from Apollo. I heard it. Yeah, yeah, that's what. And you do tests. You test it so that you can te you test it out to make sure that you can manually do it, and that you can also do it with, uh, um, uh, you know, automatically sensing that there's a, you know, significant shift in flight dynamics. You know, when a rocket exploding underneath you gives you a big change in your flight dynamics. If it senses a significant enough flight dynamic shift, it will separate. So the amazing thing to this day that, that, that floors me is that Pete Conrad, in the middle of the Apollo 12 launch, when they got struck by lightning, and everything went offline, you know, all of their alarms went off, everything, lost battery power, all their cautions and warnings went off, they knew, you know, he had that abort <laughs> and never, never initiated it. Um, and then uh, when, uh, I'm just blanking on it, Dave, help me, Shira and... 76. 76, the Shira and Borman? Um, no, Borman was on 7. Level. Borman, Borman level on 7. Um, Shira was, Shira and... Was it Conrad on the bottom? Was it Conrad in there with him? Yeah. He was going to pursue the space. He was going to run the... Was there even targets that you're running? Yeah, you know, running the two spacecraft together. And a little bit of back to the back. This is someone there was straight, got stuck in the fuel line, the type of tune lights up, shuts down, and the rocket. Rocket going back and forth. And Molly's like, okay, it's not exploding. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's an incredible tool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, naval aviators, by the way. Cool. Um, <laughs> so, that, um, real quick here, Kathy, let's do the drawing for our for our prizes, and then we can see if anybody else has got any questions. Right now.